pictures like this in your talk. That's right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah okay, so I'm very pleased to introduce Alejandro Rodrigo Guevara, also known as Alejo. So Alejo did his undergraduate degree at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia in Bogota, and then he decided he wanted to try out the winter phenomenon, so he moved to Connecticut, <laughs> University of Connecticut, where he did his PhD with Margaret Rubega. And in the course of his PhD, he discovered uh, by, both by mechanical manipulations and theoretical modeling that our traditional view of nectar feeding by hummingbirds was completely wrong. He, he falsified it. He showed it's actually not an inelastic sort of pressure differential kind of system, but rather a peristaltic and highly flexible pump. So it's totally revolutionized our idea about nectar feeding in birds. He's been here now as a Miller Fellow for about a year and a half, and he's working on the integration of feeding and respiration, whereby hummingbirds have to the very high tongue licking and swallowing frequencies but simultaneously have to meet the very high metabolic demands of flight. So it's like drinking a latte while running full speed on a treadmill. It's really hard. You should try it. So, uh, and uh, Ale has a tremendous background in comparative biology of birds. And of course, the most interesting um, birds, actually the most interesting birds would be the hummingbirds, I would guess. And uh, there are only about 325 species. A few people in the NBC work on them. So it's, it's really worked on the fascinating questions now intersection of natural selection and sexual selection, which is the topic of this talk today. The broader title is Nectarivory Energetics and Intersexually Selected Weapons. But uh, more importantly, the fun fact about Alejo, and I didn't actually know this until about three minutes ago, <laughs> the largest bird I've ever caught on a mist net was an emu. <laughs> How do you want to speculate? Uh, unintentionally, of course, such a fierce dinosaur. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to be talking about nectarivory and weapons. So then let's start by, you know, like framing it into surviving and reproducing. And I'm going to be talking about feeding in the surviving side and same-sex competition for reproduction. So this is the talk structure. Uh, first part is about feeding, including performance. And the second part is about the trade-off that I'm proposing with these uh, newly discovered weapons and a broader concept of intellectually selected weapons in animals in general. So I, wanna, I don't want to continue with before acknowledging all my funding sources, all the wonderful places I uh, visited to his work in many different museums and uh, of course this has taken a long time to work with uh, these species uh, in both in the field and in, in surveying museums and um, I wouldn't have been able to do all of these without the help of many many people including all my mentors, collaborators and uh, field assistants. Also, you have see you, you see some familiar names uh, here. Uh, the Europe apprentices or the museum curators and staff, and of course all the birds. So, uh, being in museums is an integral part of my research. So, even for these that is not uh, purely museum based, museums are vital to move forward. So. Uh, let's start with the nectar intake biophysics then. This is a survey I've done uh, across birds, and it's amazing that <coughs> nectar feeding has evolved 23 times. Uh, we have some crazy ones like sandpipers, and some very interesting ones like parrots that I have videos from if you're interested in these particular cases. <coughs> of course, including the amazing uh, songbirds and honey eaters in passerines. But today I won't have time to talk about those. I'm going to focus on hummingbirds. And if you think about what hummingbirds are, everything revolves around feeding on nectar. So everything from their daily struggle to the coevolution with the flowers they feed from is uh, about nectar. But the real question then is how do they do it? How, what are the details of this uh, nectar feeding process? And <clears throat> the way I approached this was to looking at particular species and trying to see what flowers they uh, feed from and replicating the flowers 
uh, in this case, this <coughs> heliconia, you have a curved flower inside with the nectar on the bottom. So I mimic this by making feeders that would have those characteristics uh, matching the concentration of the nectar. So we would train hummingbirds, wild hummingbirds, to come to these feeders. And we film them with high field cameras to slow down and study every step of the process. So this has opened new windows to <clears throat> what we can learn about how birds feed. And I'm going to uh, split this. And first, we need to talk about morphology. So the hummingbird tongue is forked at the tip has fringes here and is hollow. So the distal portion looks like a couple of cylinders, but the base portion is solid, so they cannot use it as a straw. Um, they can only control the base of the tongue. So when they <coughs> move it, you see that the rest of the tongue is just uh, laying there floppy. Uh, so that's very interesting because they don't have any muscular control over what happens to the <coughs> um, I explored the morphology further with CT scans. This weird dragon is actually a hummingbird beak. <laughs> and when you go through, you can start uh, seeing the three-dimensional configuration. And here I'm going to overlay some techniques to explain further. So I'm going to have some scaling. For instance, this is a grain of salt to give you an idea of how tiny these things are. And I'm going to zoom in here. And you see that these folds, the, the group walls around here, are really thin. And if you see, if you look into the composition of these group walls of the, of the tongue, then you see a keratinized band. And this is going to be very important because when you look at the composition, the architectural composition of this tissue, you see a very interesting brick wall arrangement. So these structures are going to give uh, pretty cool properties to the tongue. And if you push that electron microscopy really hard, you can get to the composition of it, which is beta keratin. So the same material that the, feather, the feathers are made of. and. Uh, Different from alpha keratin, beta keratin is very good at folding, but storing energy to recover the original shape. <coughs> so um, these structures that are easy to fold are going to be important for this process that we call fluid trapping. So we have the grooves, and then we're going to look at those grooves from the inside of the flower. So this is now going to be an inside from the nectar. And you see that when the fringes and the grooves enter, they just open up. So they relax inside the nectar. And when the bird pulls the tongue back, then those little fringes start closing up, actually trapping little drops of nectar. So this is a very dynamic process and uh, was a very cool and unexpected discovery. So we know what happens inside the nectar, but then uh, many times uh, what you know, the rest of the tongue is outside the nectar uh, is because the flower they're feeding from is depleting. The nectar is depleting inside the flower. So there is uh, this gap that you know, leaves the fluid trapping um, you know, leave it short to actually collect more nectar. So what happens here? Uh, and we mimic, to study these, we uh, use red dyes to see what the process feeling uh, of the, the rest of the tongue happened, was <clears throat> that when they, when they are crossing this gap, they, uh, as soon as the tongue is going out, they compress it, <coughs> and then they release that compression when the tongue is full with nectar. And this is operating an elastic pump. So how this elastic pump works? In the morphology, we saw that these really thin grooves are foldable, but because of the architecture and the composition of them, that makes them non-stretchable. So when you have a structure in nature that is easy to fold, but then tend to recover the shape, 
is great for elastic potential energy. So this is going to give it that pumping force that the tongue needs. And here, uh, this is the same um, setup that I showed you before, but this is zoomed in. So this is the build tip and the nectar is here. So I'm just going to play this video. And I'm going to show you how the, the potential energy is released when only when the tongue tip touches the nectar. So um, that should go. Okay, so I'm just freezing the image at 12 milliseconds, so you know, so you can see how compressed this structure is, how flattened it is, and then when I keep playing. Uh, you see how it changed. So this actually <coughs> expanded and filled with nectar. So first it compressed the stored for its potential energy, then it released it and then filled with nectar. Uh, and the amazing thing about all of this is that it happens really, really fast. So in about a hundred <coughs> of a second, which is uh, way faster than we thought they could do this nectar collection process. To test these ideas, we developed this LSO hydrodynamic model, which I'm not going to go into the details, but we uh, use information from the CT scans and the, <coughs> and the properties of the tongue to actually make predictions uh, about this process in nature. So this <coughs> graph shows the feeling time, <coughs> so how long it takes for uh, a given amount of nectar to feel completely <coughs> the grooves. Here, so here the, the grooves are filled with nectar, and this is the length of those grooves. So in uh, this diagram would be x here. So x-axis it would be this. Point. And we can play with that model, make predictions for different species, uh, including you know different uh, tongue lengths, etc. And this is where uh, it gets interesting because a competing group was working on the on figuring out how hummingbirds drank and they put hummingbirds under uh, artificial conditions in the lab and they actually demonstrated that they drink using capillarity. So this is their data which is really different from our predictions. So um, what we did was try to mimic flowers the way we've been doing for a bunch of different species and instead of <clears throat> having them in the lab we would uh, put them, have them uh, in, so wild birds would drink from them and we can match to see if it would look like this or it would uh, be capillarity. And what we found was <clears throat> this match to our predictions which our engineering collaborator wasn't too happy with, <laughs> but for us it was pretty amazing. And uh, what happens is that, as they demonstrated, capillarity is physically plausible, but it's not biologically relevant. And the reason is because if you take, let's say, uh, a length of six millimeters, a short, big hummingbird, then you would predict that by capillarity, you would take this long to fill with nectar. And this uh, would allow you to move the tongue six times a second to get uh, nectar out of the flower. But what um, you can do is go down and calculate how many times a second can a hummingbird uh, move the tongue to actually fill it with nectar and see if that matches what they do. And what uh, this means is that capillarity is really slow and elastic pumping is super fast. And this much is what we found in uh, like wildflower videos uh, and previous publications at feeders. So the conclusion of this part is that capillarity is too slow to keep up with the feeling rates uh, and the, how fast they move their tongue in nature. Okay, so now we solve the tongue issue uh, just so you know that that group never published anything again after that paper. Maybe they're working on it, I don't know. 
Uh, okay, so now the, the build tip <coughs> is uh, very interesting as well because <coughs> the, the edges of the beak get thinner as uh, when they get near the, the tip of the beak. And what this uh, happens is that it makes a puzzle match with the tongue shape. So the tongue is being uh, extruded here, uh, matching this concave and flexible in inner shape of the beak. And this is a uh, close-up of the of that process of the of the beak actually squeezing, and you can see that it's really tight how they do it. So this friction is high, so this has has to be pretty uh, soft to avoid damaging the tongue tissues. Okay, so the the tongue the tip of the bill is a ringer, and now uh, we can summarize that through natural selection. This big shape uh, is like this, it's flexible, it's concave, it has blunt tips, and all of this is to give a good seal of the, of the tip. So now that the nectar is released, then uh, how do you actually swallow it? And to study this, we place markers, virtual markers on the, on the beak. And I'm showing you here uh, the tracing of the yellow markers at the base of the beak and the same for the tip and you can see that this is a really weird asynchronous oscillation so this is not what you would expect if you imagine uh, how bird open its beak and this is going to be very important for the for the feeding process so to translate this into actual uh, performance of the bird <coughs> then I want, I want I need to point out that the hummingbird tongue at the base has these little flaps, which we call tongue wings, and that the base of the tongue is tracking the tip at all times. So we, with this uh, information, we can reconstruct the motion of the <coughs> tongue inside the beak using a uh, couple synchronized high-speed videos. and. To backlit filming, we can actually see inside the beak. Uh, so if you pay attention here, you can see some uh, motion and bowels of the nectar, uh, which took a long time to get, but this is just going very fast through many years. So, uh, using this, we can reconstruct what they actually do. And it is um, animation, I'm going to show you this is the opening of the tips, this is the opening at the base, the tongue is going to move back and forth, this is the base with the flaps, and the blue shade is the nectar. So the, <coughs> the nectar starts filling when they squeeze the tongue, then the tongue base comes, and when it pulls back, it's actually like dragging the nectar backwards. And all of that is synchronized with this uh, peristactic movement of the, of the bill. So now we finally know how they do it. And putting this together uh, as a summary is <coughs> that there is a fluid trap at the tips, expansive filling, uh, that pump, a uh, ringer, and these processes that we are still working on naming them properly. <laughs> OK, so now. Uh, in the performance, so now we can go back and ask the inter interesting questions like performance, and is how these mechanics actually influence what the birds experience in nature. <coughs> and to do this, we develop high-speed camera traps, which is just through basically through basic uh, electronic uh, triggering system to get videos at flowers, and this is the kind of videos that we get. Um, so here. You can see the nectar bubble here, and you can count how many leaks it takes for the bird to deplete that nectar inside, which is something that we could have only dreamed for before. Um, so we have that data, and this opens the door to hummingbird economics. And this is what we're doing, calculating all of these parameters to get 
the energy from the nectar. And the reason I'm here working with Robert is because we can calculate the power output through aerodynamics and uh, metabolic measurements to actually um, get into how much energy they spend. And the way we do this is it, uh, this is now a picture on the flight lab, and this is the kind of experiments we're doing right now. So varying the concentration, the orientation, and now studying both how fast they drink, how they uh, move their wings, and how much oxygen they take in, in each one of these steps to finally um, understand the energetics side of hummingbirds quantitative, quantitatively. So here, I'm gonna just show you some of uh, the new advances that we're making <coughs> on this uh, front. <coughs> we're using computer vision with the uh, computer machine learning and here at Berkeley. And what you can do with this is, uh, instead of manually tracking the wings, we, we can use uh, Python to you know, have it done it, do it for us. And this is very convenient for those of you who have like, <laughs> marked frames before. This is a um, <coughs> diagram that shows the kind of experiments that we are uh, developing. And this is uh, the kind of uh, respirometry we do to measure performance <coughs> uh, in terms of metabolism. And the idea is to move all the inferences that we do in the lab all the way to flowers, connecting them by having birds uh, feeding it at the feeders. So one of the examples uh, of these proposed experiments is this one. So this is in Colombia, <laughs> and we have wild birds just coming. Here is uh, a RF ID, so it, it can read the P tags that we put in birds. This is a bird uh, that when they come, the you know you can we can get the information about their weight. We can get uh, the information of how fast they drink. If we take the perch off, then we get the information about how uh, how they hover, etc. And uh, you get extra information, uh, which is interactions. So the, because this is open, they love to fight. Uh, and they, you know, when one is in the feeder for too long, then another one is not gonna be happy with that. And what they do is just get on top of each other all the time. So they, <laughs> they just leave off fighting. Okay, so <clears throat> this is all about <coughs> net energy gain. And the reason why this is important in a, an evolutionary context is because this is what is behind the coevolution. So all of this variety in hummingbird uh, bill shape is being taught to be due to a bill uh, flower matching. So in other words, the, they minimize the energy expenditure, maximizing the gain they get from each flower. So this is gonna be uh, the connection to <coughs> the evolutionary patterns that we see. Okay, so now, the trade-off. So, what is this um, pressure that is on bill morphology that is beyond flowers? And how, how does this variation affect energy intake? So, what they use their bills for beyond drinking is to do this. So, this is a, a museum specimen from a sparking violet year in which you can see here this tip that they actually use to stab each other uh, when they are interacting in nature. And uh, we have a lot of anecdotal, anecdotal information on this front, but we wanted to test it, and the way to test it was to work on the <coughs> species, which is the long bill hermit, and what we found in this species is that it doesn't have those serrations, but it has a very dimorphic bill tip, which is uh, this overhang here that we call dagger. And we can measure it. Uh, we can 
uh, and make predictions out of, uh, about it. So when you compare juvenile and adult females uh, on this elongation, uh, there is not much difference, but when you compare juvenile and adult males, you see that these daggers only appear during puberty. So this is definitely linked to adulthood. And then uh, to see if these could be used to inflict damage, we measure the force these big tips are required to pierce. And again, when you compare females now, they're lumped together. And juvenile males, they are the same. But when you put uh, adult males into the mix, you see that they, least, they need less force <coughs> to actually pierce something. So these daggers are very good for that, for piercing. And <coughs> the, <coughs> the relevance of these uh, is because we wanted to work in this system, which is legs, and this is just a, a short video introducing what a leg is. So. Standing in the middle of a hermit leg, a place where males come together to attract and compete for females. This leg is a stage for nine or ten singers. And as small as they are, their voices carry across an arena of some 300 by 450 feet. I recommend this documentary. They feature different aspects of our research. So, <laughs> um, so this uh, category that we have here, floaters, is the ones that are outside, they stay outside that circle of those territorial males. So these are birds that for one reason or another they are outside and cannot get uh, into those territories. So the reason why all the males want a territory is because this is like a singles bar. And if you don't have a seat in that single bar then you're low in uh, you know like dominance hierarchy and that's not what females are looking for. So they fight really hard to get uh, uh, sit there. And when you compare the actual territorial males, so the ones that are able to uh, fight and win a territory, <coughs> you, you see <coughs> that they have much longer uh, daggers. So they do have daggers, but are smaller than the ones that are actually holding territories. So <coughs> this is an indirect measure of how these could be linked to mating success. And uh, the same with uh, other measurements that we took, like pointiness uh, and uh, uh, the modified bill tips that we found uh, in, in, in this species uh, is true for different species of hermits. And others, it means that other species, for instance, this is the clade that uh, topazes have normal wing tips. Uh, big tips. So the normal ringer is, as I described, for uh, squeezing the tongue really well and is efficient for drinking. But this is not. Right? So this is what, you know, one of those extreme modifications uh, of only males in only <coughs> a few species of hummingbirds happens. And I still don't understand how these hummingbirds you know, alive <laughs> So right now we're um, trying to get to the genetic basis of this dimorphism uh, with Nicholas and Noah. So this is going to be a pretty exciting uh, aspect of uh, the research. And we're collecting videos of how they use their builds to fight. So this is one of those. Uh, I have plenty if you want to see more. <laughs> Uh, these these uh, birds try to stab each other, so if you see here, <clears throat> this one is going to try to stab the chest, but this is going to outsmart that move. So. The stab was counteracted by a bite that actually took a feather out of the <laughs> other guy's face, fortunately not the eye. But, um, yeah, they're pretty mean. <laughs> so, they actually are using, are using these big uh, So the interesting 
trade-off that I'm proposing here is between uh, natural selection, making the bill tips one way for optimal fitting, and sexual selection, making stiff beaks, conical bill tips, uh, sharp daggers that what cause is this gap between the tips that is not good for uh, feeding. So this is uh, what you see at a you know, broader scale. Uh, the message then is that we should start you know, looking them more as like little aerial pencils than, let's say, think about it. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Jimmy and uh, Robert and other people's uh, topology that now I'm working on to actually plot these traits. And you can see these backward serrations have evolved uh, here in black uh, many different times uh, in hummingbirds. So the reason is, is the question is why are what are the conditions that are promoting these uh, weapons? Because not all of the, I mean, most of the species don't happen, actually, so that's interesting. And by doing this, then I move to, uh, are there other examples in birds uh, of these weapons? And most of them, the, most of birds have weapons in the form of spores. These spores, uh, this bird, I got too close to this nest, mm -hmm. and it was like diving at me. But when I saw this, I decided to leave. <laughs> it was getting really close. So they have wing spurs, they have uh, tarsal spurs, and um, but the, I, I I wanted to find uh, a paper that had looked into this, and I couldn't find anything. And when I looked into weapons in animals in general, then uh, I found that there were many gaps, and I decided to fill them. So. <laughs> Uh, now this is the uh, intersexually selected weapons, the last part of the talk. And what I call intersexually selected weapons are traits that are dimorphic, that are present in only males or females, and that has, have to be used as weapons during these confrontations. So these questions that are driving uh, this survey is which organisms have these kind of weapons, uh, which are they, and what are the morphological and evolutionary trends uh, in nature? So we did a pretty exhaustive live, you know, tree of life survey, which took forever, but it's finally <laughs> out. And what uh, we don't include is these exaggerated traits that were included in previous reviews. So we we don't include traits that we don't know what they were actually be using uh, for. And uh, these traits that they have no reports of uh, use as weapons in same-sex uh, competition, or uh, in general, like intraspecific competition. So out of these fish, the only one that classifies under our conditions is the kite in salmon here. Uh, similar things with other traits that were included in, in previous uh, reviews, <coughs> which actually were pretty inspirational, and I'm working with Doug right now in, into uh, solving this. But for instance, uh, in, uh, some of these traits are used in courtship or assessment, but never as special <coughs> weapons to fight with. Uh, I included, we included uh, birds, uh, amphibians, fish, uh, that were, that haven't been included so far in these reviews, uh, which is uh, tons of animals. And we found that in general, uh, if you look at the bilaterian tree, they are only found in three of these main phyla. Uh, you wanna give it a shot, which ones? <coughs> Let's go arthropods. <laughs> yeah, for sure, arthropods, <laughs> for sure, vertebrates. And the other one I'm just going to tell you because it's, it was super unexpected, which is nematodes. And they have these weird spicules. And the question is, why in only these three? Why not in others? So now that we know where they are and where, how, what to look for, we can 
uh, keep exploring further. Uh, they are restricted to bilateria, probably <coughs> because of the frontal comp uh, you know, component of the fights, and also because of the uh, generic underlayings of aggressiveness in bilaterians. And this is the uh, tree of arthropods that shows in black branches the arm clades. Uh, so if you see one that we are missing, please let us know. <laughs> and these are examples of these weapons. They are overdeveloped structures that what females have, and they are used, uh, you know, in the head, in the back of the body, uh, in frontal appendages. It, there is a lot of variation from these. Even these weird aliens are actually flies that fight with their heads. And in flights, there is a lot of uh, these weird projections that have evolved only in males and only to fight each other. This is the three invertebrates. Uh, you can see here in the, in the black terminal <coughs> branches the, all the different groups with weapons. And the interesting part is that they are in the locomotory appendages. So here, here, this close, these, uh, they have never touched a gym in their lives. <laughs> they are jacked, so, <laughs> so hormonal development to fight. Um, these weapons can, tra can transform uh, fish and normal frogs into these weird creatures that you know, will soon be in your nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they have different styles of fighting. Some weapons are used for displacement, some weapons are used to injure, some to test the strength of the opponent. Uh, platypus are the only ones that have actually a chemical weapon, so they have venom that only males have to fight each other. Uh, the, one of the interesting results from this survey is that we see only these exaggerated weapons in non-hunting animals, like herbivores or small prey hunters. So why not big hunters have them? Um, these are some examples of these <coughs> uh, intrasexually selected weapons. And one cool thing is that they are almost always found in males, except in, those, in these two cases. So in the entire life, life, tree, life tree, there is only two instances in which the female is the one that has larger weapon, the larger weapon compared to the male. So, uh, and in these two instances, they fight for different things. The beetles fight for access to reproductive resources. The jacanas actually fight for males. So why this hasn't evolved many more times, there is a lot of examples of sex work reversal in nature but these are the only two cases of weapons, so we don't know why. Uh, and the weapons that we know a lot about are actually exceptional in the way that they're not modified locomotory or feeding appendages. They are not well developed structures compared to the ones in females. So they're like sort of de novo evolved and free to evolve into many different shapes. And this is true also for uh, all the antlers and horns in so, um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and now we know all that is behind to start working with. And the takeaways from my talk are that now we solve the biophysics, so we have a solid knowledge to start building on to develop models. Uh, we know how hummingbirds drink, and we can start exploring how all the other independent nectarivory evolutions of nectarivory uh, in birds, those birds, how they feed, uh, convergences, parallelisms, alternative solutions, etc. Um, we have a way to uh, measure performance in the wild and then compare these to what our models would predict, and this would help us to understand coevolution with flowers better. Um, this is a perfect opportunity to study this talk of war between sexual selection and natural selection pulling in different directions. And we can quantify these uh, by measuring how well 
these birds with these weird built-in string compared to females, for instance. And finally, all these uh, conceptual and practical developments in intersexually selected weapons that I'm proposing. So, uh, that's the end of my talk. I just want to understand the laws of biology. We have lots of time uh, for questions. Sorry, yeah, I rushed, but I wanted to have more discussion. What about when uh, so, like, the permits have like a decurve bill? Uh, how does like sort of the curvature of the bill influence the action of the coming repeal? Um, <clears throat> okay, so the curvature, what it does is allows you to get closer to the nectar pool in curved flowers but it's actually detrimental in straight flowers. So that's why this matching occurs. Uh, the actual intraoral transport is hindered to some degree because you cannot have that nice peristactyl pump. So for instance, Eutoxeris, which is the sickle bell hummingbird, they have really wide uh, wing, tongue wings, which are these flaps at the bottom. And I think that's because they cannot do anything but just dragging the nectar every time. So they're not doing the peristalsis, but they're uh, just dragging with the base of the tongue. So it, it, it has a large impact. And it, has, it's, it also has a large impact in the way they fight, for instance. They, the, the videos of hermits <coughs> that we have fighting, they don't go straight at the other like this, like in failing, but they actually fly in a, in a curved angle to hit you know, like this. So, yeah, there, there is a lot to explore in that. Um, I don't, oh, oh, sorry. Keep going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, no, I was just going to say that, of course, that there is a pretty good opportunity to um, understand if this dimorphism in bill curvature is due to ecological causation which is the current uh, idea, which is they feed on different flowers, so they have different bill curvatures. But what could be happening is that the males uh, have straighter bills because that's easier to transmit the force, and that's what is driving this. So if you do like a full phylogeny comparison, then you would find if this trend is uh, biased, and that would give you a sense. Oh, well. <laughs> so, um, if you ever had other birds that are also nectarivores show up at your feeding station, so and maybe give you a little bit of insight into how they're also performing nectar um, feeding, is it similar or completely different? I, I wish, but unfortunately not to, to these ones. But because they haven't showed up, I've been chasing them. <laughs> I've been, you know, like designing feeders just for particular instances of, uh, for instance, diglosis. They have pretty cool uh, and completely different feeding strategy because they have to feed with the with the beak open so they cannot squeeze it ever. So flower piercers are these birds and what they do is they, they hold the base of the flower with uh, the mandible and they pierce with the maxilla and then through that hole they stick the tongue out so they need to retrieve the, the nectar somehow and because they can't squeeze it what they do is actually use the base of the tongue as a bellows and uh, they just pump uh, the nectar in out, like leaving that hose uh, touching the nectar until they get it. So that's, that's pretty cool. And yeah, so there are many other instances that I would love to show you videos. Do you know how age plays into the development of the weapon? That's that's a great question, and and the that's another advantage of placing the p tags in these birds. Uh, we are planning to track them year after year to see how the beak changes. Um, for the hermit system that we have, that we tracked for five years, uh, there is <laughs> this first burst of development, development the first year, but then after that first year, it sort of stays uh, the same. Sometimes uh, what, they, what happens is that they break the, big, the, the building or like parts of the bill, and we think that happens because of the fighting. 
uh, but they are able to recover. Uh, so one year we found one with a broken teeth, and then you know we, we caught it next year. So that year that had the broken teeth wasn't able to hold the territory, but then next year was fully recovered and then was holding a territory. So it, it plays a, a big role, at least for the first year, and then after that we are still trying to understand. Uh, so in uh, artiodactyls, there's work done uh, a, a while ago, more theoretical papers by Valerius Geist, uh, speculating that um, in these animals, the headgear, the weapons that are on top of the head, evolved to actually reduce injury uh, during male-male competition. Do you have any insight into how prevalent that might be across uh, this whole big scope of life? Um, yeah, so... Um, the only instances of living animals that have aerial confrontations besides hummingbirds are hornbills, and there is only one species that does it, and they actually go and clash <laughs> like in the air. But the cask in these birds is completely different from the other species that have casks. So uh, if you compare the series of actuactyls that may have these structures, um, then you see changes in density in you know tissue composition then that could give you a clue, a clue to you know comparing with these hornbills that what, what what is used for display what is used for actual you know head body if i can just follow up yeah. on that there's a very interesting case of the the bighorn sheep and and the mountain goat and of course the bighorn sheep is the one that goes to the bash head well the mountain goat is a you know, comes in from the side and stabs. So they have this same habitat uh, requirements, but the dominant species is the mountain goat mm -hmm. because this this sort of slow motion thing isn't fast enough with a guy with a dagger. <laughs> so even though the mountain, the bighorn sheep is typically larger in body size and so on, uh, if, if you go where fo both occur, if uh, if the uh, if the goats want a particular piece of habitat, they grab that, and the bighorns have to go find the next best. And that's the way they sort of shift around. Yeah, and, and that's pretty cool because then that makes you think of okay, you have a weapon that evolved for one purpose, but you can use it for any other purpose. And this is uh, is evident in hummingbirds because the species with weapons are dominant over. The unarmed species. So maybe one weapon that evolved for intersexual competition, then now is using interspecific dominance. So, so. Yeah. Um, so hummingbirds also eat, uh, incorporate a lot of insects in their diet, and there yeah. seems to be a bunch of variation among the species. Um, I guess they also, they also do a lot of nectar robbing behavior, like Beglossi, uh, So. Do some of these, like tooth-billed hummingbirds, show shifts in diet or behavioral? So, um, yeah, that that is a good question. That was the first hypothesis that was uh, out there for the existence of these kind of dimorphism. And I did my undergrad thesis with artifact hunting strategies in hummingbirds. And what I found is that the females are actually the ones that are hunting for spiders and things like uh, substrate-based prey, which these would be useful for and males are doing fly catching, right, so from a perch. Uh, so these big tips are showing the opposite trend that what you would expect just based on alpha hunting. So I, I think they, they could use them, right, but I don't think that matches the data that is available for why they happen. I'm curious uh, if you can be able to show whether or not there's an actual cause for feeding mechanics from these or if they have some other additional phenotypic changes that offset that? Yeah, um, so we don't have the stats yet. <laughs> we have the data and we are like processing because we want to be very careful controlling for many different factors. Of course, yeah, I want to say yes because that's what the preliminary shows, but we want to control for uh, the distance between the bill tip and the neck. We want to control for um, like how far can they push compared to the females? You know, like th there are different uh, <coughs> aspects that you need to control for. Yeah. 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 Y
we're doing that right now. You, you made a, um, a, a big deal out of the fact that the weapons are only seen in three phyla. And I, I just kept wondering, well, you know, have people really looked carefully in tardigrades or rotifers? Or, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That's, that's a pretty fair question. Yeah. But, but I think, I don't think people have looked especially hard enough in nematodes. Uh -huh. But still, you know, like those papers are out there. So I think there is a lot of surprises. Uh, but I think the dimorphisms that you find are not like hinting to the existence of weapons. So I, I have uh, another data sheet with all the potential weapons, um, you know, the ones that have dimorphisms but not behavioral component, because that's the hardest, I guess to have evidence for the use. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, many of these phyla are just not that dimorphic in the way that would suggest a weapon, which is puzzling. And I think, I hope many more phyla have them because that would give different points of comparison, but we would just need to keep looking harder. Yeah. All right, let's thank Alejo for a spectacular <laughs>